there we go. Fantastic. Hello, Rotem. Hello, Thank how you. are you? That's a great flag you've got in the background there. <laughs> Thanks. It's from my last DEF CON. I spoke over there a bit. Fantastic. So our next speaker, uh, Rotem Barr, um, is Head of Marketplace Integrations at, at Cyber Security. And you're going to be talking to us about package managers and security, uh, Rotem. So uh, we'll keep the show on the road and I'll pass straight over to you. And uh, the floor is yours. Great. So I'm Rotem and I'm going to talk about package managers. And part of like what I do, actually, I'm a cyber paladin, uh, already 20 years now, and I'm uh, building a marketplace on application security marketplace at cyber security. Uh, cyber security is helping organizations all over the world protect their CI/CD pipelines. And because I'm building and uh, looking at all the different attacks that were in the passive and the software supply chains, I decided to talk a bit about package managers, about how they how you can, what you can trust and what you cannot trust in uh, these different package managers. So I'm going to focus on a few and I will give a lot of examples and I hope you will enjoy. Um, I do a lot of bug bounty in Israel. Uh, so there's a bug bounty Israel group uh, I'm organizing. Once a month we have some meetups and I'm just hacking and building stuff uh, since 2002, since the army and all over the place, automotive uh, company satellites, production plants, uh, banks, Whatever you want, I I help protect them and less hacking into them. But this is a part of what I do. But today I will talk about package managers. So if you go to Wikipedia and you try to look what is a package manager, it's actually a program that wants to install, upgrade, and configure and remove programs from the computer. But most importantly, it does it in a consistent manner. It means that if you want to install something, it will install every time the same package that you want and you won't have any surprises. And this is now in my presentation, I will show you where it goes good and where it goes bad in different areas in these package managers. So back in the old days, I was downloading uh, lots of stuff and uh, I used the get right because I wanted to uh, download it all night and then disconnect from the internet. Uh, now nobody discussed about from the internet, but then you had to have different programs that help you manage, manage your downloads. But today we have much more uh, interesting and more easier ways to install. And you can just like say, I want to have a package like called Dragons. I just pip install Dragons and it magically appears inside my computer. It magically, all the versions, everything uh, happens. And even I'm so lazy and today we are, we are very lazy, so we even can just clone a repo or have a different uh, project we want to install, do npm install or pip install or whatever install, and it just knows from a configuration file exactly what I wanted to install, installed it. I don't even know why it installed it, how it installed, and uh, it's kind of black magic uh, from uh, this area today. So we are uh, we are having much, much, lots of trust in the package managers themselves to install whatever they want to install. But we are talking about a lot about package managers and I want to talk a bit about what is, what is a package. So a package can be a lot of stuff. It can be a very large package that has a, a years of a changes and lots of people working on it. And it can be something like is a number I gave, I gave an example over here. Is number is a npm package. It has 250 million downloads per month. It has four gigabyte downloads. I don't know what's a gigabyte download in GitHub, but it's a gigabyte download. I think it should be milliard. But it had like so many downloads. And basically, if you look at the code, this is the code. It just does like I think seven, eight lines of code, and that's it. And uh, it was maintained, it was last updated, I think, five years ago, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and if you, you can see there's an OpenSSF uh, scorecard uh, a program that goes over the most common packages and uh, sees, uh, and sees uh, what's the scores and they have different categories. And you can see it, it wasn't maintained, it doesn't have code reviews, it doesn't have uh, best practices. Uh, it does have a license and that does have different stuff. So it got a 4.8 scope and everybody uses it. You have 250 million downloads a month 
And the big question over here is what will happen if someone one day will change this package? A maintainer can go and add this two lines of code and you know that hack system just is something that is very bad and you don't want it to be happening on your computer. And uh, the moment he will update it, it will start new new packages and new programs that, that want to download uh, this specific package, will download the new code and will run it inside the uh, development uh, computers, inside the CI, CD, inside different areas. And the question is who can change this package? So we have the maintainer itself. Now we have like uh, colors and faker and uh, there are a lot of, uh, now because of uh, uh, different politics and war stuff, uh, people just say, yeah, I'm maintaining this package. I, I'm the maintainer, I can change it. I will add this code uh, to the package and uh, just uh, ruin it for everybody. And uh, sometimes the people just like pull the plug on the package or they change something or they do other stuff. And and the thing is it starts breaking or even can hack into different uh, uh, areas. The other way is hackers. If I have, let's say we have the UiParcelJS or Core or C, these packages were hacked. If someone got uh, the password of the maintainer. It's uh, very easy to find the email of the maintainer and then find uh, his password or uh, in other ways like phishing attacks and stuff like that, they can hack in, They can hack the account of the maintainer and then, and then again inject code and uh, have fun with the packages. The third thing is confusion attacks. Uh, Alex Wilson showed us, uh, I think last year or two years ago, uh, dependency confusion attacks, the way that if you have private repositories and public repositories, and you update something in the public repository, which is private, and the package managers get confused and can download by mistake something from the public repository instead of the private one. Uh, this, is a, this was a very interesting attack and it was able to hack lots of companies and lots of different areas. And so the question is, why is this happening? And this is happening because we are all lazy and we don't want to have fixed versions. And uh, in the dependencies, like all the package managers have different areas of uh, supporting this. In the package, I can say, I don't want 1.21, but I want every time it will be upgraded automatically to upgrade my package. So I won't, to, I won't need to have different types of uh, uh, development and the adding and checking and verifying. I trust the package to be, that it will, everything will be okay. This is why we have this uh, carrot uh, that says you can uh, you can upgrade any uh, minor and uh, patch version uh, in the semi-semantic version of here. Um, to fight these problems and to fight and to find a way that we can create reproducible builds and have uh, to know exactly what we want, so we created log files. And log files mean. I know you wanted to have 1.21, but actually when the developer tested and the, the pipeline tested the, in the testing area and the, and the developer machine, actually what he, he checked what was the 1.4.8 version. And actually this one, the version had this, this integrity, this SHA-512 integrity, and this is what was downloaded. So anybody in the future that wants to download this uh, version, should go to the log file and uh, um, should not download anything else. If you download anything else, please stop. Uh, please stop uh, downloading and installing and uh, uh, check what 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 was the difference. And this means that now developers need to update the log files. Additionally, to update the JSON files, let's say in NPM. But then my question here is, what can go wrong? And this goes into a research I've done uh, and uh, lots of other people that also done in the internet this past year and uh, uh, even uh, further back about package managers. And if you can, uh, this is not a live show, so I don't have, uh, I, I cannot ask the crowd over here, but if you look at this Docker file and you probably can see a few problems, I will go and uh, show you the different problems that I found. Maybe you can find more. But the Docker file, if you use the latest Docker file, every time you will upgrade, 
it will uh, upgrade uh, every every time someone will push a new tag into the Docker a hub, for instance, or ECR or whatever, uh, it will download the latest uh, version and not from uh, a specific tag or even a specific uh, hash uh, that we wanted to use. The other thing is over here you didn't see in the pack uh, we added only the package JSON by mistake to the Docker file, and now we, uh, we didn't copy the log file into it. So what happened is inside the Docker file, it didn't know which versions were locked and it uh, guessed and wanted the internet and wanted the latest uh, copies and downloaded uh, uh, the new versions with the malware, virus, whatever uh, we had over there. And the other thing is if you go to the left, you have NPMI, NPM install does actually NPM install updates the log file and it doesn't, it, it tries to go and find uh, what are the locked versions, but if it doesn't find, it doesn't force you to use the locked versions. NPM CI, what it's supposed to do is uh, validate the lock file and validate it's only the locked version that in the package lock. And this happens in all the languages, not only in NPM, but I'm focusing on NPM because actually they had many problems in the last year and it's a good research ground. So I went uh, for an instance into Amazon in the past and uh, when I was uh, creating a new Lambda function, I saw the Docker file had uh, the same problem, the copy package JSON and it didn't copy the log files. And this means that this was the default template for uh, Lambda functions and everybody that uses the default uh, template were vul vulnerable. So I contacted the AWS and we fixed it. And now every time they added the asterisk, so it will also copy the log files. But also there's a recommendation to run NPM CI minus minus production because it's much more secure uh, running NPM CI and not NPM install. NPM install doesn't verify the log file itself. So in production, we always recommend to use the log files. And this is one thing I want you to learn from and to see from this presentation. Use the log files. Don't uh, don't uh, delete them. Don't uh, disregard them. Uh, you make make sure you use them, even if they are there and if they are not there. Uh, you just it's very important for uh, the health the health of the CI/CD environment. So using npm CI, let's say we installed Axios with a specific version and they have this package lock uh, file. And when I do NPM CI, because it found 0.21.4, NPM CI should always install the 21.4 version. And this is happening, uh, this is how it should behave, and this is how it behaves in NPM 6. Uh, and uh, if you can see, when we changed it in the package JSON, I was lazy, I went to the GitHub, changed it uh, to dot one, I did NPM CI, and it failed. It failed the build. And then uh, it couldn't continue until we change it back or update the package lock uh, file. The thing is, I investigated NPM 7 and uh, in the start of the year, NPM 8 also. And I found out that when I do the same thing with NPM 7, nothing happened. Like it didn't it say, yeah, okay, it's great. Uh, you changed it. So maybe I just. Uh, add uh, install the, the version you wanted to do it. So it didn't look at the log file at all. And actually, because there was a change in the package JSON and didn't find it in the log file, it went and downloaded a different version, a 22 version, because the 22 version was the latest. So it was kind of a mind blowing event for me. You know, I saw that CI doesn't really work. And this went, I went to the internet and then I, uh, I saw actually before I went to the internet, I saw also, I did another uh, game. If I created an empty log file with only an, an empty JSON, it just worked. It added everything. So if you want to bypass all protections, you can create a package lock uh, with an empty JSON file that uh, continues without asking questions. Uh, unfortunately, we fixed it after one year, like NPM fixed it, uh, I went to the GitHub and I went to the issues and saw someone uh, say, yeah, last year uh, NPM succeeds when package lock doesn't match. So I tried to understand, we opened a CVE for it. Uh, 
I think uh, the CV got a critical base score, but I don't know if it's that. I would put it, give it a seven point something, another nine point eight. Still, it's not shell shock, but it's uh, really interesting to see that uh, um, this was uh, getting serious, and uh, after a while, they fixed it. Uh, get up one and fix this uh, problem, and now in the latest NPM version, I don't. I think eight one point four. And above, it doesn't uh, happen anymore. But if you go to NPM and look into the issues, you see there are other issues. When you use overrides, it doesn't work correctly. When you use the integrity, it's sometimes not repaired automatically by NPM and not noticed. So there are still different problems. And, uh, and I think one thing we need to learn about this, that the packages themselves and the package managers are there to help you download the files, but you cannot trust them entirely not to have bugs in them and not to have uh, like they're constantly trying to improve, but you should verify yourself all the packages and verify yourself uh, that the integrity is uh, uh, properly and uh, before you download and after you download, you need to make sure because the package managers, some will do it for you, some will not, some will say they do and will not do it correctly or not, or not understand. And this is a game that we need to understand play until we have like a proper RFC or way to verify that what you wanted to download was really downloaded and that's it. And uh, I don't think, I don't know if there's a standard today for downloading packages. And this gives me to another bug that uh, I found last year. And this is actually, I spoke at DEF CON uh, last year about the, uh, a different malicious code analysis. And I was uh, investigating scanners and the uh, security scanners and how I can make them execute code. So if I'm a hacker, how can I attack the scanners that are scanning my code? And I found out that the same problem happens also in NPM. So I'm saying NPM, but it also happens in different uh, package managers. So I will show you this uh, soon. But if we go into NPM and uh, I want to find a way to run it safely without running any scripts, without uh, running uh, any code that can happen from the package JSON, from uh, the different areas of the repository. I just want to install to download the packages and do nothing with them. And this is why we have NPM CI, you minus one said no scripts. We can download the we can download the files and they all the pre-install, post-install, all, all the scripts, they shouldn't work. And this is a good uh, practice because sometimes when we use uh, the package managers, we have credentials to our repository and uh, other different uh, credentials to push stuff to uh, CD. And we don't want to mix the different environments. So I want them not to run any script. So for instance, if I want to have a secure way, I have an NPM token. I run it with minus one second scripts and then unset the NPM token and run my post install scripts. So, and this way I'm, I'm more secure and they don't have any way of a leakage of a, the NPM token. The thing is that NPM does look for .NPMLC files and this is by definition. And these .NPMLC have instructions of what NPM should do. So if you go and you put let's say a dot npmlc inside your repo then when npm will run it will have it will look for let's say npm6 looks for unload script and in this unload script i can inject a javascript script uh, inside my environment uh, in, uh, inside my own repo that will uh, execute and this is a way to bypass the minus minus signal scripts Actually, it's not really bypassing because ignore scripts wasn't ne never was never intended into not running scripts in different ways. It was only intended to not run scripts in uh, in the post install and pre install and all the all the life cycle the script life cycle. So it's a bit confusing, and there is no real way to prevent npm to run it. In NPM 7 and 8, they fixed it and there's no unload script anymore, but you can just replace the git um, shell file with uh, evil git and then uh, it uh, happen the same. It will just like create the same uh, um, 
same option. The thing is over here, you will need to create another NPM uh, package that gets from a Git repository instead from the unstore NPM. So the attack scenario is uh, pretty interesting. A developer can add a uh, .npmrc file, push it into uh, his repository, even it's a local repository. If it goes through different scanners or different uh, the Jenkins uh, the, um, CI build, uh, build files, the CI build pipelines can go and run and uh, uh, execute the NPM, and then you can uh, run CI script, uh, steal the CI secrets, uh, have production access, network access. It is uh, part of Jenkins is also a code execution as a service platform, but you never intended to become from an, from the package JSON itself or from different areas over here. But this also happens in Python. If, for instance, someone has a pip install and uh, pip install is looking for setup py and setup cfg, then setup py is Python. You can just like put whatever code you want over there and it will just work. It does no, it's by definition importing Python and running Python. So you don't have anything really to do about here. There is like verifying in the setup CFG, it's much more hard, but setup CFG now usually is invoked by setup PY. I think, I think in the future, like there's changes now that you can run it without, but it's still not mature enough. Uh, again, with requirements.txt. So you have a different way to install requirements.txt in the pip, you can just like say, uh, give a list of requirements. And over here in the requirements file, usually it's a uh, line by line, but you can have special flags. The minus R flag tells access another requirements file from a different source. You can put a file like etc pass wd and get the log files, uh, the pass wd into the log files, or you can just like access the local network by HTTP and have a SSRF target and start attacking in uh, resources outside, inside the area of the network. So it's pretty cool to how to abuse all this functionality. And uh, the same goes for Ruby. It's just the gem file, just Ruby file that is executed. So the same thing happens. And this is like, by definition, package managers will execute code. And we need to un understand this and we need to understand that this is what they do and put the proper protections around it too. So when we execute something and we know it has access to different artifact uh, repositories, it has access to uh, secrets, it has access to the environment variables, it will have access, uh, access to everything. And someone with enough intent will be able to execute code over there, even if it's a static configuration file that doesn't allow you to execute code. I think the last thing I want to talk about uh, is auditing. And if we see auditing, so we have lots of security auditing and different, we have lots of tools, but also NPM gives us out of the box uh, security auditing for vulnerabilities. And this is uh, usually I just like install a package, I do NPM audit or just even by default when I install, it tells me how many vulnerabilities you have inside the package. And it's very reassuring that to know, ah, okay, there's a critical sign, a vulnerability, I will update it. So I'm going into when I'm signing uh, like pack resolve of 4.2.0 and I know there's a high severity vulnerability, then NPM will just tell me there's a one high severity vulnerability, you should fix it. Uh, maybe 4.2.1 will be fixed or uh, they go to the latest version and then we should have a proper way to fix vulnerabilities. Don't just not use log files and then they will do latest all the time because we will have the problems from this start. So we need to make sure we have log files. We need to make sure we have these vulnerabilities. And when there's a vulnerability, act upon it, install, uh, upgrade the, the vulnerability, uh, upgrade the package and test it before uh, just automatic uh, testing uh, viruses, new viruses. Uh, but what I understood and uh, I found out in NPM version six, when you give an alias to a package, then it won't validate the package. So if I gave like pack resolver the same alias exactly 
as pack resolvo so it does nothing for the code and it actually works as intended but npm audit or even other package uh, scanning uh, um, uh, solutions will not will not see this alias and will be fooled by the syntax i don't know why it really happens but it will find zero vulnerabilities they actually fixed it in the uh, uh, version and uh, the latest in npm 7 and npm 8 and then you can see there are different ways so to bypass this so if we go to um uh, out of store package, let's say github.com. Uh, I go to the GitHub repository itself. Still, npm does some magic and goes and tries to resolve the pack resolver and it knows the GitHub and it goes and finds that this has a vulnerability. And that's pretty cool that it was well, succeeded in doing it. But when I'm going into and I, I try to play with the syntax a bit and find out how to bypass it, so if I go and download it from a specific git and i added a dot after the github.com then i successfully bypassed the protection or like uh, the mapping that uh, npm did and was able to uh, download uh, without any audit and this means that if i'm a package uh, if i'm a package maintainer or i have uh, some code i can add this piece of code and the, the audit will not find it. It will not find the, any vulnerability inside it, which means that also the security team will not know about, it will not know that there's a vulnerability, but it will not know also that the package manager skipped this uh, vulnerability. So like I, I asked them and we talked about in the RFC of it, I talked to the NPM team to check if we can add an RFC, another like, not found zero, zero vulnerabilities, but how many packages were skipped in the process of testing it? Because we have this package that is skipped, and it didn't it didn't succeed in validating the uh, and checking if it's vulnerable or not. Uh, because dependence are recursive, then you have a problem that even if you have this awesome project and you have a dependency, but this dependency has an out of store dependency that you weren't aware of you will still, still see zero vulnerabilities and you don't even know that it did some kind of cheating and the, the bypassing the whole protection of in the future. And this is a good way to add in malware or add in uh, versions that in the future you can just update it and it will automatically update. Um, so it's a good way and it's uh, too bad that we don't validate our own vulnerabilities. And this is uh, something that I want also to like, think about, that you should always, even that you have inside these package managers, you have SBOM and the uh, software bill of materials, and you have vulnerability analysis, and you have all the tools, you should trust them that they, they will want to do their job, but they don't want, they, they don't do the more uh, advanced uh, testing and you should have a mature solution that creates proper SBOM, creates proper vulnerability analysis, creates proper uh, testing. And most importantly, that you know when it fails, when it doesn't do. So you, you need to know what it, that it does be able to, to get the vulnerabilities, but that also that it failed is for some reasons over uh, some, or somewhere. Uh, we had, Actually, last week, uh, there was a bit of talking about the NPM package maintainers, and uh, someone just like filed and they created a tool that to check unregistered domains. So if we have a maintainer that is a maintainer for a very known package, but his domain got expired, someone can just buy the domain and then reset the password into his account. So this is uh, something that happened, and then yeah, we saw lots of people starting to scan all the packages and found like 11,000 uh, hi hijackable packages. And there was a bit of a, a lot of noise in the week, uh, last two weeks, I think. Uh, and just you should know, you cannot fully trust the maintainers because they created a package. They Sometimes they forgot about it. Sometimes they, they didn't continue. They are people, they are hackable also. They have domains that are hackable. 
and the DNS and that's uh, the whole game and it's very hard to protect everything over here. So your next task is to find all applications in your organization, organizations that the maintainers don't have an email, uh, um, uh, that don't have a domain or the domain expired. And this is very hard to do. It's nobody is really doing it. And if you will do it, you will see how much problems you have uh, inside all of the packages. So a quick recap, package managers install what they want. They execute unwanted scripts. The audit checks are easily bypassed and just random people maintain packages and everybody uses them. Uh, but we rely on open source. We cannot live without package managers. If you will tell a developer now not to use any package manager, it will be a problem for them. They like it's part of a day to day life. I use it every day. Uh, but we need to know how to protect ourselves. So we need to make sure we use log files to verify log files are in use, to manage our correct uh, software bullet materials database, and to monitor for every package download that is not in my software bullet materials. I want to make sure that package managers don't have any permissions. Put them in a container, put this container in a box, put it in another sandbox, give them as min much minimal permissions as possible, monitor what they do, treat them as viruses uh, or uh, with least uh, permission and just don't let them do anything. I know they need the internet access. So, uh, and uh, from other checks, just like run other checks with external uh, checks with external tools, make sure you are uh, taking into account also the specification file itself and also the log files. Don't you, if you, also you have a log file, sometimes it will be lost in the way. Sometimes you will have a differences, a drift between the specification file and the log file. What will happen? You, you don't, you cannot rely that the, the package manager will always use only the log file or use the specification file, or maybe a developer will remove it and delete it. Uh, at the end, the most important thing you can do is make sure that in the binary and the container itself, you have the same packages that was supposed to be in the log file and it's supposed to be in the specification file. And this is the way to validate that it's everything is uh, true and uh, enough, nothing drift enough, nothing moved into production. And if you have out of store packages, just verify them manually. I would just like say everything that is not inside the package manager repositories, you have to verify manually. You have to check it, to test it. And if there's a change, I don't know, sign it and uh, make sure that everything is uh, valid over there. Any questions? I don't know how much time we have. Thanks, Rodham. Um, I think we've, uh, we've got a minute or two, so we'll take a couple of questions. I think Andy had one for you. Oh. Hi, thanks for the talk. That was really fabulous. Um, that domain hijack you were talking about at the end, um, I, th there's lots of things that we can do there, um, and it looks like a, a lot of the a lot of the problems that, that you demonstrated there were to do with malicious updates, so maybe an untrusted developer, something like this. Do you think there's a space for code signing in the, the package registry? <laughs> I was the... <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I see people. Uh, first of all, yes, I think like code signing is uh, everybody's talking about it, and it's the next thing that uh, people want to start to do. It's a code signing from code signing commits and the code, code, uh, code signing even different areas inside the package itself. You see we have integrity, but it's, uh, it's not enough. And uh, the more we have ways that we can sign different areas, if I can sign the code and then sign the container and sign everything else and validate the, everything inside the container and inside the build systems, so validate everything inside of the different steps in the way, it will be much more easier. The thing is, when you validate something, when you sign something, you need to make sure you have the proper solutions and the proper security controls that you just not just sign on a blindly. You need to verify it and then sign it. So if someone adds a very like execution code, uh, so maybe this time some static analysis and then after doing static analysis, sign it automatically. 
Yes. Okay, and uh, one more question. Are there any statistics of the uh, prevalence of attempts of attacks within the most popular package managers? Um, this is hard. Actually, I don't, I didn't play with statistics. Like, I'm more on the defending side and looking at different, like, from the overall view and trying to find the problems of the future. I don't do too much incident response. So I don't know of statistics, but we do see that like in the past, uh, like we had uh, because of code cop, for instance, a lot of uh, shells started popping up around the world. Uh, Monday you had in their IPO uh, risk uh, that they were hacked and they co their whole code base was sto could have been stolen. Uh, so we do have different uh, risks over there, but because every company, because it happens inside the companies themselves, and it's not like public public information, I don't think we will ever have proper statistics. Okay, that makes sense. Great. Um, thank you very much, Rodan. Excellent talk. Thank you.